So the two sisters who had the eSIMs, they, they texted me and they told me, one of them, th she didn't want to scare me. So she only said that the situation is dangerous. But the other one, her text was, pray a lot for us. They are here. Okay. Um, and... How did you feel? Receiving I this felt, message, I felt, they are here. I felt that they need a miracle to survive. Right away? You yeah. felt this way? Yeah. Because it was in December, like, almost three months after the war started. And, I, and everything was clear that it's, it's a genocide, no no exception for anyone, no exception. Um, Who was in your home back then? All my family members, my parents and my siblings, five siblings. Hello and welcome to Palestine Deep Dive. Today I'm thrilled to be joined by one of the most brilliant Palestinians, one of the most resilient, one of the bravest people I've met, maybe in my entire life. Today I'm joined by uh, Hala Abulibda. Hala is a pharmacist based in Glasgow and uh, she reached out to me three weeks ago. Uh, to hear from me how I coped with the loss of my family. And then I encouraged her to speak up for the first time after three months of silence. Hala Abulibda, thank you very, very much for um, agreeing to come to our show today. I really, really appreciate that. And I know that you uh, decided to speak out after three months of the war, after the horror that happened to you and to your people in Gaza. And I, I really understand what you're going through because, you know, me personally, I've gone through the same, maybe less. Your story is more painful than mine. Before we go to, um, to, to our questions, I would like to share with you something. A few days ago, I was uh, overseas and uh, I was in a conference. And at the beginning of the conference, they asked me to introduce myself and uh, to say, a, to say something about what happened to my family. So I introduced myself to maybe 70 or 80 people. And then I told them that I lost 21 members of my family, my father, my brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews. And everyone was heartbroken for the, uh, for the following three days. Every now and then people would come to me and they would shake my hands. They would give me a hug maybe. And they would tell me that they are saddened with what happened to me and they would give me this this look you know with their eyes that my tragedy is a huge and um, and unimaginable pain i'm going through but some part of me uh, i would always remember your story and i would tell them that what happened to me is nothing compared to other palestinians and what happened to them and um, now I would like to know a little bit about you. Who is Hala Abulibda? Tell me about your childhood. Yeah, sure. Firstly, uh, thank you for giving me the chance to tell the story, to tell my story. And it's my first time to talk about it. If I start by my childhood, so... I was born in Saudi Arabia, where my parents uh, worked as teachers there. My mom studied Arabic literature in, in Al-Azhar University in Cairo. And my dad studied uh, mathematics in Jordan. Then they worked in Saudi Arabia. They moved between cities like Abha, then Ar-Ras Al-Qasim, Hafr al-Batan, then al Uh I was born in uh, Ar-Ras. And then we moved to uh, Gaza after my parents worked in Saudi Arabia for almost 20 years. 
uh, and then I studied uh, for the secondary school in uh, Al Khansa school in eastern part of Khan Yunus. Um, for my childhood, as well, it was because it was mainly in Saudi Arabia, and okay, we used to go to Gaza in holidays, so um, it was just the information or the the I mean the image about Gaza was created in my mind that that's a very different place from Saudi Arabia, so. That's a place where I can hear, for example, the fire or like um, I smell the gas, tears, bombs. I heard the fire. But it, was, it wasn't like very clear to me as a child what's going on. Uh, so there was all, all, always like a lot of questions that I asked my parents why this happened to us. Why, why there is, why people here is like, especially children, why they are always scared of something. I tried to understand it by myself because I didn't want to let other people around me like feel like I'm scared because I, I, I see the worry in their eyes. So, yeah. You have said that um, your parents used to live in Saudi Arabia. So did my parents, you know. My father lived in Saudi Arabia for five years. And uh, most of my aunts also were with him. Most of them were teaching uh, teaching in Saudi Arabia. And this is the case for many, many Palestinians. I mean, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians uh, during the 70s and 80s. Do um, you know, because of the de-development of Gaza that was imposed by the Israelis, most of them, they either uh, work in Israel or they would go out, travel outside to work in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait in Qatar, in, in other, um, in Iraq, um, and many of them, it's it's really um, a nice fact that many of our parents and our grandparents, they went there not as laborers, they went there as teachers, as engineers, because the Palestinians were the most educated uh, in the Arab world. So, and uh, you know, ever since I came to the UK, I would always meet with people from the Gulf area, and they would tell me that I was uh, Palestinian teachers um, uh, taught me at school. So it's always the Palestinians who were um, leading their way uh, in, in the Gulf area. They were teaching. They were, do they were doing a really good job. Um, can you tell us a little bit how that the difference of life was between Saudi Arabia and Gaza? And I assume you came to Gaza during the uh, blockade in Gaza. Uh, it was before. It was before the blockade? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when I moved to Gaza, um, it was during my uh, secondary school time. So I studied the secondary, uh, I studied in the secondary school in Khan Yunus, Eastern Khan Yunus, Al Khansa school. Um, I can say that there is a huge difference because I was moving from a stable, peaceful environment to like completely different one, like the opposite one. I've experienced like different, like horrible situations. It was during during the first year, it was my first time to, to hear about someone who's been killed by Israelis. It was our neighbor's son. Um, the situation in the in the area, and um, I got shocked. Um, I got shocked to the point that I wasn't able to go to school. Okay. Yeah, um, because uh, I also uh, so yeah because that the scene of his killing was also streamed on the TV. Okay, it was something document documented. Um, so Do you I, remember why he was killed? I'm not sure about the situation. Sorry, I'm not sure. But I remember that he's been killed, and then and then they he, they took the body and put it on the on the tank, on the front of the tank. 
Why do you think they put his body on the tank? Just to humiliate him? Humiliate his family after he's killed? Because it, it happened many times. One day, I one of the scenes that I, I could never forget is, you know, the one day the, there was a farmer in, in Gaza, in the eastern borders of, of, uh, of Gaza, and one of the Israeli bulldozers came and, and killed him. And then they, they, they carried with, the, I don't know what, what you call it, the, the handle of the bulldozer. They carried him like like a, like an animal or something. And that was uh, recorded, and we all saw this. So scenes of humiliating the bodies of the Palestinians after they killed him, after they killed him, is, um, is widespread in, in, in Palestine. And especially during the genocide, we have seen horrific photos of mutilated bodies, of uh, desecrated bodies. And I, I don't understand why. Why do they do this to the Palestinians after they have been killed? We have a lot of but whys you, in our minds. But you, like, you cannot forget this scene. No. You no. cannot. This was the first time you have been exposed to yeah. killing. For me, that was like, I can say, the beginning of the stories. Um, how old yeah. were you? Almost um, 16. 16. And what year was that? 2002 or three. Okay. Yeah. That was before the... Uh, before the siege. Before the siege and before Israel with the Jew from Gaza even. Yeah. And you were in the eastern part of Khan Yunus. Yeah, in Bani Suhaila. Do, do you remember you... For example, uh, when I was young, and uh, I used to live in Deir al-Balah. Deir al-Balah is, is in the center of the Gaza Strip. And then my uh, my mother's family used to live in Gaza City. So every time we want to visit my grandparents or my mother's family, we would take the car. My father would drive us in his own little car from Deir al-Balah to, to Gaza. And every time, every time, my father would, would drive us to Gaza, we would see in the middle of the, of the road a tank just sitting in the middle of the street. In many cases, it would just block the street so people can't cross it. In many cases, they would shoot at Palestinians. One of my cousins actually in, in 2003, I think, or 2002, he had a heart problem. He had a heart condition. And then the Israeli tank started shooting at the, at, at the people there. And then he fell and he died. Not because he got a bullet in his heart or something, but because he got a, a, a heart stroke. attack yeah, or a stroke, attack. and he was killed. Uh, my sister, when she was going to school, to university, from Deir al-Balah to, to Gaza, I remember one day, I, I could not forget this um, scene. She came home and she was horrified. When we asked her what happened, she showed us her bag, her school bag, and there was blood on it. We asked her what happened, and she said, she said she was just sitting in the taxi, and next to her there was a man also going to university, and he got a bullet in his head, and he was killed, and he was sitting just next to her, and her bag was full of blood. So that was the routine of the Palestinians before Israel with the Jew from Gaza. A tank just would, would sit there, shoot at the Palestinians, and block the street, not allow the Palestinians to move, just like that. So. Uh, one time when I was in, in, in my car, in our car, and I asked my father, why would the tank sit here in the middle of the road? Why would it block the entry of the Palestinians or the movement of the Palestinians? And he said something I could not forget. He said, just because it can. So there is no reason. Just because it can. And this is something that has been going on with all the Palestinians inside the Gaza Strip when the Israelis were in Gaza, before they withdrew from Gaza. Do you remember scenes of, 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 of similar uh, incidents that happened in your area in Khan Yunus? Yeah. I just remember also another thing. So, um, we used to we used to talk about all of that with our 
grandma, for example. And they were talking about stories that I thought for a while that this couldn't be happen. That they were telling stories about like the time after Nakba, how they escaped the war in like in 1967. And it was, there was a lot of horrible stories. And I still remember that there was one of my grandma's friends. So people in the area, so whenever they want to remind someone of her name, or for example, if someone forget her, her name, forgot her name, they were like, remember the, the lady whose, whose husband has been executed when he, while he was going to his work? And that was long years ago before even my mom was born. And then after finishing, yeah, there was a lot of stories like that. So that was like the stories that we used to hear. It, it, everything is about like killing, the suffering of people. And it was, sometimes it was like, there wasn't even a time to, for us, I mean, at least me and and like people in my age, I can say, to process that. So when I, when it was my university time, I've also experienced going through all these checkpoints every day through my journey to the university. So it's like from Khan Yunus, eastern part of Khan Yunus, and then to to Al Azhar University in Gaza. In Gaza, Gaza yeah. yeah. Um, I assume there were many checkpoints from Khan Yunus to yeah. to to Gaza. Yeah. Yeah, there were. And yeah. you know, for for those who don't know, what's the difference? The distance between Khan Yunis to Gaza, just twenty five kilometers away. Yeah, or like, less. Yeah. Or less. Yeah. Maybe. Or maybe, yeah. maybe less. Yeah, and the the situation was like, okay, we have the plan to go to the university, we have our schedule, and then we go. So at the first checkpoint, we wait. No one knows for how longer. You should wait. Sometimes you will wait till the end of the day and then you go back. Uh, and that's the same situation if we are going back from the university. I remember one time, yeah, I've, I've experienced like staying overnight on the checkpoints when I'm going back from the university. And there used to be like a huge, a very long queue, I can say, from the checkpoints and that like toward like Dar al side to, I don't know, maybe for two kilometers or more, just queue of cars and people who just walk trying to get like closer to the checkpoint. So when there's a chance or when the checkpoint is open so they can go by walk, if it's allowed for them to go by walk. And I remember one time, it was only allowed for people to walk through the checkpoints. So they announced that by microphones. And then when we started walking toward the checkpoints, they started shooting Israeli soldiers. They started shooting people everywhere. So we ran away. We didn't know where to go, but we were trying to, to stay alive. I remember when we, yeah, I we I remember when we were like running away. That there was some people who just felt on the ground, and it's like no one even noticed that they felt on the ground. So, and we weren't sure if they got injured or not. And on one day, so we used also. To walk to get like to the taxis in the first or like closer to the checkpoints. I remember it was Ramadan. We were fasting, and so I managed to get to the first taxi. And we were we weren't like we were. Like, it was like over capacity on the taxi. So it's I think only six people should be in the taxi, but we were 
I think 15 or more. So when the checkpoint opened, that was on my way back from the university. So when the checkpoint opened, the Israeli soldiers, they let, I think, five taxis or more to get in. And then they closed the checkpoint and they didn't open the next checkpoint. So we were trapped between the two checkpoints. And we waited, I think, for 10 hours. 10 hours. Yeah, or more. And during this time, so we were the first car in the queue. So there was a jeep in front of us and another jeep behind us. And the soldiers were out and they bought their... Um, M16. M16, yeah, over, over the jeep door toward us. Okay. They pointed the... They the, pointed the gun on you. Yeah, they pointed the gun toward our... Uh, taxi and it was on both sides there was on both sides and I was next to the window and when I looked that way I I saw the gun like pointed toward us we how did were, you feel I just and wh why why did why did he do that were there any justification whatsoever to point the gun at you as I told you, the, we have a lot of whys. Why? Why? But no question. Answers. No. It's not like there's no answer. The answer is clear. The answer is clear. Everything is done. Is like it's against Palestinians. It's against Palestinians presence. Uh, and it is it is done in all ways. In in different kinds, it's like horrifying Palestinians, humiliating Palestinians. There is, there is many of like ways that this thing would impact people. I mean, human beings. So after waiting, we were like, okay, we just, all of us, we just stayed Shahada because we were like, okay, this is, this is our last moment in the life. And after hours, so they asked the first taxi, our taxi, to go around. There was like a spacious area, is like just to go another area. It's not another area, it's, it is still between the checkpoints, but it's like away from the road. Mm -hmm. And they asked the taxi to park in a certain way. So our taxi was parking that way and then they ask us to get out of the taxi. And when we get got out, there was maybe 10 jeeps, uh, 10 Israeli jeeps toward the taxi, like toward, so if the taxi is mm. there, so the jeeps were just parked that way. And all jeeps, there were Israeli soldiers, who were pointing their guns, guns to toward us. We stand, they ask us to stand just next to the taxi. And then, and I remember well, the, the lady who was next to me, she was pregnant. And she, and she got pain. And at the same time, she, she was crying in silence and I was scared to the point that I didn't ask her if she's okay. And then they asked the guys to take off their clothes one by one and to go one by one toward them. And then, yeah, they took them one by one and they keep the guys. And after a while, they asked us to go back to the taxi, the girls. And we waited after like, long hours they yeah it was like an order to go by walk mm. through the other checkpoints and i remember i walked like for kilometers just to arrive to an area where people can pick their relatives or friends or families from like after getting from the the checkpoint yeah that was one of of 
um, one of the stories. One of the stories. It's, it was like every day there was a story. But yet you decided to keep going to university. Yeah, I. Decided. And you studied pharmacy. You studied pharma, and now you are a pharmacist. Yeah, I studied pharmacist pharmacy, and I remember that I wasn't able to go to many exams because of that. And there was like plans to, it wasn't even easy to, to study for my uni, but I was like, at least I should go to the uni. Even I, if I don't have time to study or to review or to have a look at what we, we've been taught, but yeah, I was dedicated to finish my study. Um, yeah, they, they left Gaza before I finished my university, so. Yeah, but it was How did still... it feel for you the moment that Israel left Gaza, withdrew from Gaza, and then you were able to go from Gaza, from Khan Yunis to Gaza every day without a checkpoint? It's the freedom. It's the freedom. Liberating. It's to feel liberating, yeah. It's just to feel like it's, it's all right for people to get, to access education. And it just like, that's a suffer that's my suffering okay that's end ended now so now yeah i can go to the uni i can at least plan for my day i can do my study for example the study group i can prepare yeah i i even got like higher scores after that because before that i was it was very stressful it was very traumatic very traumatic because every day there was a story. Every day there was something. I I should expect myself to not go back to my house because I might be killed. I might be I don't know. I might stay for nights on the checkpoints. I don't know what's gonna happen. So it was very, yeah, it was very painful. But you seem to have come from a family that is very highly educated and a family that really is interested in education. Your parents studied Arabic literature and mathematics. You're a pharmacist. And as far as I remember, you have uh, a sister who was a doctor. Can you tell us about your other siblings? What did they do? What did yeah, they do? Sure. So if I start by my next sister, uh, Reem. So Reem studied physiotherapy. Um, she worked, um, she worked for international organizations in Gaza, such as Mercy Corps and MSF. Um, she worked in MSF. They have a, a 3D project. It was a, a first of its kind. It's mainly to create 3D um, masks for face and body <coughs> burns. So she worked in that project. Um, um, sorry. You can use the oil if you want. Can you tell us why do you use the oil? Um, it's okay if you don't want to answer. No, that's okay. Um, um, my psychotherapist, um, I discussed uh, with her that I'm coming to this interview and it's my first time to talk about everything. Um, and because um, one of the impacts of the of the situation that uh, it's difficult for me to focus sometime and I'm easily like slipping away. Um, so she advised me to to use essential oil when I feel like it's difficult for me to to gather all like Your ideas thoughts. in my thoughts. Yeah. And does it help? Um, yeah, it's a bit. It's my first time to try it, but I think yeah. Um, yeah, so, 
So Reem used to work in that project um, with Amasa France. She was so keen to help people, help people in the community as much as they, she mm. can. And she applied to, to Chevening Scholarship. And I'm pretty sure that she's been selected for the interview, but, but I didn't want to check her email. I didn't want to see that if she's if she's selected for the interview. You are a Chivner scholar yourself. Yeah, I'm that's a how you came to the UK. Yeah, I'm a Chivner scholar. Yeah. What um, about your other siblings? How many siblings do you have? Yeah, it just sorry, just one more thing about her. Yes, yeah. Um, <coughs> she's also last year. She's been. Yeah, she applied to be a associate trustee in MSF UK. And she's been, she's been selected for this position. Position. She was so excited. She she was she's the one who who wanted to go by and in everything in helping people in improving her skills in acquiring knowledge. It's like she can work in like on a hundred plans. But, uh, for my brother, Islam, he is a civil engineer. He's also gra graduated among honored students in the uni. And then uh, he worked in Gaza for different organizations like Action Against Hunger, uh, the Palestinian Bureau of Statistics. And last year he got the chance to go to work as a civil engineer um, in Bani Suhaila uh, municipality. He's also a chess play player, and he used to participate in competitions in Gaza. He has a nice voice, and I encouraged him to do voice over him. And he, 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 yeah, he started doing that last year as well. Because he, 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 okay, it just, I, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna use the present. He's, he's so interested in, 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 uh, self-healing concrete and applying this in like different fields and by the way it's i'm i'm only talking here about the qualifications i didn't talk um about how they are how 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 in a bit we will we will come back to talk about yeah. their merits and yeah who they are or who they were yeah. um my also, my brother, he he got married. He got married, yeah, recently, like maybe a year and a few months. Also, my sister Tasneem, she's a doctor. She studied in um, Ain Shams University in Egypt. She's graduated with uh, excellence with honor, and her her dream was to to specialize in cardiology. She moved back to Gaza and she started working to get the the license and to to work to work toward specializing and just in September last September she's so smart and also my sister Razan she's a doctor as well she's graduated from Cairo University in Egypt Qasr al -Ain medicine school she was also among uh, honored students and she got to study for, I mean for her bachelor degree she got a scholarship from uh, UNARD education uh, foundation it is a US uh, organization uh, that supports students from living area to continue their education I remember very well that she was the first or among the first students who the organization decided to support because she has a very distinguished profile. At that, at that time, uh, it was to support the student to study in the US, but she got the admission from Cairo University and because her profile was so distinguished. And so the organization they decided to give her the scholarship. 
And so she finished her study in, in Cairo University and then she moved back to Gaza to work, to work there. She got the license and then, and she was, and du during her work in different hospitals in Khan Yunus and uh, she was aware, aware that there is a need for female doctors who's, who are specialized in gynecology. So she also planned to continue her education abroad. abroad. So she applied also for Chibning, and she's been selected for the interview last year as well. This year she applied again with the hope that she can get the scholarship. Um, and her plan was to go back to Gaza and to open a center to help people there. And then the youngest sister, Shahad, she's a software engineer. When she was 16, she succeeded to create a device to convert the electrothermal energy to electrical energy using the candle lights and to use that device to charge phones in Gaza. She's been interviewed by a few channels like CNN and Xinhua, the, I think her, it's a Chinese media channel. She studied software engineering in uh, Islamic University. And she's been graduated among honored student just in September. Every one of them has like a lot of dreams and plans. And so we we're talking about two doctors, two engineers, uh, psycho physiotherapy, physiotherapy, therapist, sorry, and a pharmacist. That's pharmacist your family. Are my parents teachers? MashaAllah. Uh, my dad's name is Hamdan Abu Libta. My mom's name is Amina Abu Anza. My mom, when we moved to Gaza, she got the chance to continue to work as a teacher. So, so yeah, she continued she, till she retired. My dad didn't get the chance. Didn't find. Uh, it was it wasn't easy for him to work there as a teacher. Um, what did he do then? Uh, he worked as a taxi driver. So he used to be a teacher of mathematics in Saudi Arabia. Then he came to Gaza. He could not find a job yeah. to work as a teacher. So yeah. he he did taxi driving. Yeah, because he spent a lot of time trying to find the chance or to get the work, to work as a teacher. But it was very difficult. It was very difficult. There is no like, there is no, we don't have like, even the unemployment rate in Gaza is already like, I know, yeah, I know. Skyrocketing, so. I know, my older sister, Wala, uh, she was one of the smartest people I know. And she did uh, computer engineering. And she graduated with, uh, with uh, distinction. She was one of the smartest people I know. She kept searching for a job for 15 years in Gaza. 15 years, she couldn't find a job. Eventually, what she had to do, she had to study education, another degree, in order to work as a teacher of technology at school. Although she was a distinguished engineer, she could, if, if she was outside Gaza, she would have had the best job ever, unfortunately, and she, then she could not find a job and she was killed eventually. My other sister, Allah, she was, she studied education as well. And she kept searching for a job for, thin, for 13 years. She couldn't find a job. My other sister, and she was killed as well. My other sister, Aya. Aya, at first, she studied uh, computer engineering. She couldn't find a job. Then she had to do another degree in accounting. And she graduated top in her university, in all of the university, not just the accounting uh, major. And she was so distinguished. She kept searching for a job for 12 years. She couldn't find any job for 12 years. And then she was killed. Anyway, your youngest sister, her name is Shahid, and she invented this machine that transforms the candlelight into electricity to charge 
uh, batteries or phones. You have said something that when she invented this machine, uh, some media outlet wrote a story about her. Yeah. And then what happened? Yeah, I googled her name. I tried to find everything like written about her or posted about her. I was so happy for her. And there was a video posted. It was an interview with her and it was posted, I think, on Facebook. Um, and I checked the comments and one of the comments was uh, that girl will be killed some or one day will be killed she will not live longer and I was like you understand the psycho psychology behind this comment why would someone in the right mind say publicly that a girl that who's very distinguished will be killed by Israel. I don't know. You don't know. It was it was it was horrifying for me. I think then... I understand. I think and, and you know, I'm from Gaza as well. I know, mm -hmm. and actually, it 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 is sad to say that, and it pains me to say that. But when I was in Gaza, every time we learn about a new distinguished person in Gaza, a scientist someone who has invented something, especially when it comes to technology, we would say that Israel will kill this person. He will not live long. Why? Because we know Israel is, during its escalations in Gaza, they would target, they would deliberately kill those who are very distinguished, who could add any value to the Palestinian uh, lives. So I, 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 I would say I understand it and I don't understand it at the same time. But I know why people in Gaza would say that uh, about our distinguished scientists. And uh, Hala, I really wanted to talk a lot about many things with you, but I realized that we're, we're taking a long time. So I will just fast forward to the 7th of October. Um, I know this is a very uh, traumatic experience for all of us, the 7th of October and what happened after that. Can you tell me where were you uh, on the 7th of October? Yeah, I was here in the UK. For me, whenever I want to try or I try to put in wor words words what I'm feeling about anything I went through during or since 7th of October. I feel like I can't find I can't find words that I can use. Not because I mean not only in English but also in Arabic. Even it's my my language. But I was in the UK. And it was stressing, horrifying for me because I've I've witnessed wars on Gaza. And how many wars? Two thousand eight, twenty twelve, twenty fourteen. Um and because in 2014, uh, yeah, as, a, as I mentioned, we live in, in Eastern Khan Yunus, and it's a border area. There was a ground invasion. Yeah, and we've been displaced five times, I think, if I remember well. Five times in 2014? Yeah, and the first place we went to, it's been attacked by... Yeah, it's been attacked by a missile, but we survived it. Because of the situation in all wars, especially in 2014 and in my area. So I, I had the expectation that something horrible will happen. But I've never, I've never imagined that it's going to be that horrible. No, I've never imagined that. I've, I've expected something 
similar to 2014. I don't know, maybe. Because for me, it was... I was still suffering the, the, what, what I lived during this time. I still... PTSD, trauma. Sometimes I feel like PTSD is not applicable to us. I feel like there is a kind of, if I call it trauma, there is a kind of trauma that's specifically... Chronic. Yeah, it's, 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 it's Palestinian trauma. Because there is a kind of chronic, complex long if i can say it's it's not it's not an event that finished and then we talk about like the impacts of it. no it's ongoing thing it's accumulating so yeah it was very i i wasn't able even to go to my work so the the first thing was where we should go for my family where they should go i was even I was so scared of suggesting a place where they can go to, and then this place would be bombed. Yeah, and so I don't want to blame myself. For, and at the same time, there was this like this kind of conflict, like a lot of voices inside me. Should I tell them? So should should I? Maybe should I? Maybe I should suggest that to my sister. So she, I don't know. Yeah. And I was, yeah, I was following the news like 24-7. When, when you first heard that Hamas did this attack and killed a thousand Israelis, what did that, uh, what did that make you feel? Because I, I still remember the moment I heard that Hamas killed a thousand Israelis on the 7th of October. And I was, I was in Turkey back then with with the Umna, and I was horrified because I know that every time a Palestinian kills an Israeli, then the consequences will be severe. But this time it's a thousand and we haven't seen something like this before. So personally, I was horrified. I knew something very, very, very big is gonna happen. And many Palestinians felt the same. Many Palestinians thought that mm, maybe not. But none of us, none of us expected that it's going to be a genocide. It's going to be starvation. It's going to be this massive destruction. This too many uh, killed and injured. What did you have in your mind? Um, I was asleep uh, when all of this happened. And when I wake up, uh, I found a lot of like missed calls, messages, uh, and there was a message from my youngest sister. She, so she texted me and when, then when I didn't reply, she was like, you should wake up, something happened. I checked the news and when, the, when I knew, I was shaken for an hour and a half. Shaking. Yeah. I, I was just, I was still in my bed. I checked the phone. I saw the news and I was, I was like, what, 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 what was going to happen now? I, I, because I was like, I'm in the moment, like in 2014, mm. it was like few moment, moments, but in just in a blink, I, I heard the ambulances' voices, the missiles, the bombs, the... I saw everything, like, just like the flashbacks. And I was shaking, yeah, I was shaking for an hour and a half. And then, uh, yeah, and then I checked the TV, tried to find what's going on. And then I was like... and. It's not, it wasn't only my sister, it was also my friends. They were like, all of us, all of us, we've, we've, we were like, okay, something horrible is going to happen. But we don't know how Israel will respond to that. And we also, our 
the aware about the collective punishment. And it's it's the response will be against everything Palestinian. But but we've never thought that's gonna be like that. No, you never expected that. So we used to spend like long hours. It's like it's like the life stopped at that moment, just like checking the news, checking like with each other if where our families are. I, so I check with my friends where your families uh, is everything okay. And then when they okay, took your time. Were you in contact with your family yeah. since the 7th of October? Yeah, yeah. I would check with my sister. How many times would you check up on your family every day? Or every For week? me, I no. wanted to check every second. Every second, yeah. But I didn't want to... I didn't want them to feel like there is something horrible is going to... You know, mm. I didn't want to make that like stressful for for them. So I was many times I was like, okay, maybe I just I will send just a dot, like to see if if they are connected mm. to the internet. I just want to I'm just like trying to find anything if they posted something on the social media without they know about it. I just want just to check them like indirectly. Yeah. And um, on the first days after the 7th of October, you would talk to your family. What would they tell you? How they were? Were they sad? They terrified? Were, they were so scared to the point that they didn't want to talk about anything. They were, they were terrified that if they talk about anything, that they've been killed if they if even they mentioned that there is something in the news or even so it was even difficult for me to call them especially at nights for example they are not online at night no one they they turn their phones off they are like we don't know because we were like we should expect everything we should expect yeah we should expect everything but it wasn't it wasn't that what they Expected. And they were all living together, father yeah. and your parents and siblings. Yeah, all at our house. Uh, they were all together. Were there other people in your house, like uncle? Or is it just the house just for you? For my family, because we used to leave the house whenever there is a war. We leave from the, the first moment. But this time, my parents, my family, all of them, they agreed to not leave and to wait to see. So people from like closer to the border than us, mm. they started like just escaping the areas because they expected a ground invasion, the same. I mean, the same as happened in the previous wars. Yeah. Um, so one, so they, when people escaped an area, they just try to find a safe place, so they scatter. So it's like they also separate themselves. So it's like not all the family together because they are scared like of being killed together. So they want one or two of the family yeah. members to stay alive. My family were like, okay, we maybe we should wait. Maybe because in the 2014, we got the chance to to escape, to run away in the last minute. Mm -hmm. It was, so the Israeli tanks and soldiers, they were like only a few meters from us. And we, we escaped the area to the western part of Khan Yunis. Um, so 
I think they, they thought that they can do the same. Yeah. But they stayed. They stayed home. Well, how was their condition? Did they have food and water? For them, everything was scary. Every everything was scary to. I mean, they need to do was scary to do. They were even so. In the time of the war, sometimes neighbors assure themselves by checking if their neighbors mm -hmm. are still in their houses. So my family were like, they were like, okay, we can see people in their houses. So maybe the situation is still. Mm -hmm. So they were trying, at some point, they were trying to, so for example, with with our neighbors, my family, that was before the truce, let me talk about before the truce. They were trying to exchange the food. So if you have, for example, the flour, I can take the flour to make the bread and mm. I can give you if I have more like beans or so we can share what we have. The... One of my concerns was about my mom because she is a cardiac patient. She has hypertension. She ha she's a cardiac patient, and she uh, she has health uh, issue in her like in her blood. So there was a medicine that's not available all the time mm. in, if we can say, normal or none, not war times. So I was trying to find out if they can find the medication or if they can uh, at least for two weeks, for example, yeah. because it's difficult to go out. Um, yeah, that's... And then what happened? Um, I remember one day before the truce, um, I tried to call my sister and there was no connection. Um, and I had the feeling that something happened. And then I checked the news and there was a news that the next building to our house was bombed. Um, How did you feel knowing that the next building was bombed? Yeah, I tried to call all the numbers I have. None of them worked. And I tried to call my friends if they know anything about my area. I was shaking to the point that I wasn't able to hold the phone in my hand. So it took me time, like minutes. I remember after that, I remember that I saw a video. There was a video on that was circulated on Instagram. Mm -hmm. It was about a guy whose friend uh, was under the rubble and he was trying to call his friend to check if he's still alive or not. And he was shaking to the point that he wasn't able to hold his phone. And I saw myself in that guy. I, I told my friend, if you want to know how I was, this is how I was at that moment. And then after, I think, an hour, my sister answered the phone and she she told me that they were okay and yeah an hour after that or an hour and a half it was it was so everything everything impacted my health i got a migraine uh, attack during this hour. I tried to, I, I took the medication and I tried to just to calm down and after an hour I got the message, it was a text message that um, one of my, uh, one of my trainers mm. uh, <clears throat> has been killed with his wife uh, in Jabalia. And he was the first one who used to encourage me to go on and to continue despite all the difficulties. <coughs> yeah, who used to encourage me to continue and to continue my edu education and to go toward my future goals despite all the difficulties in Gaza. 
So when I got that news, I, I was like, okay, a lot of things is going on. It wasn't only the, that news, but because there's, there was a lot of news videos that went viral and all of the news were like, there is no time to process all of that. I will leave it till the end of the war because I was also following with my friends and they were telling me stories about their families yeah. um, and how much the situation is like, how much uh, the situation is horrible for them, like something that's unimaginable beyond human, humans' capabilities. We also, the thing is that, and I assume that all Palestinians felt that way, especially Palestinians from Gaza. My friends and I, we felt like we are in a queue and everyone has a turn to suffer. But despite that, we, 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 we've never imagined that the suffering will be that. That's much. So then there was a choice. And the truth, there was uh, exchange of prisoners. I think the truth lasted for 10 days or 15 days. And um, during that time, you were still hearing from your family. Yeah, during that time, um, there was some news about the intention of uh, Israeli forces to invade and uh, attack the eastern part of Khan Yunis. There were also a um, couple analysts who thought that this is gonna happen. So my family, they were trying to find a place to go to. Mm -hmm. And the, at the same time, they were trying to, to secure food, to find like water and to find the medication for my mom. There was uh, internet connection uh, during the truce and you were in contact with your family um, during the truce. There wasn't, a, uh, yeah, there wasn't internet connection because during the bombardment of the next door building, um, the, the internet in our house got disconnected. Okay. So during this period as well, I was trying to find a way to help my family to get connected to the internet. So we, I sent some codes for eSIMs to my sisters so they can try to use these eSIMs. After the truce finished, my family were still, still, they were still looking for a place to go to. On 4th, on 4th, 4th December, Sorry, just take your time. Yeah. Do you need to use the oil? The, the helicopter sounds doesn't help. Yes, the helicopter. It's, it actually reminded me of the wars in Gaza. You know, ever since I came to the UK for many, many years, every time I hear um, a door slams, I would be terrified. It reminds me of the of the wars in Gaza. Yeah. It resembles the same sound. It triggers a lot of emotions in my mind. So yeah. this helicopter is, is the same. Yeah. yeah. We we I think and most all of us, we become like jumpy people because yeah. yeah. So for me, I mean till now is the helicopter sound. The if if the door like if someone like hit the door forcefully or also the the ambulance sounds so I, yeah. I know so I feel like yeah I'm freezing 
So ambulance takes me back to the March of Return, especially directly. And I would remember all the horrors I've seen in the March of Return. That sound of the ambulance because it was like all the time ambulances going there. But, but that helicopter, it's it still terrifies me until this moment. Anyway, you're saying. Yeah. Um, on the 4th of December, December um, so just one day before, uh, my sister Razan, she was in uh, Nasser Hospital. She volunteered to work there with doctors. And she had a long shift. But she decided to go back to get some stuff from home. And it was very dangerous for her to go back because she needs to cross uh, Salahuddin Street. Yeah. And the Israeli tanks were very close to, um, to the area that she needed to cross. And she also needed to walk a long distance. It's like from far in the west to the east, and she walked with a colleague. She went back home, and my family plan was to evacuate because so the area the area was divided to squares and got numbers by Israeli forces. So my family realized that's going to be like a very dangerous area. My sister-in-law, she was the one who left the house. She went to the western part of Khan Yunus to check with her family if there is a space for my family there because there was a lot of people. And then once she arrived, they got the see the papers like thrown by the Israeli helicopters that they need to leave the area. Mm -hmm. So it was it was chaotic for people. They didn't know where to go. So she went to another place. So my family checked with her if, they, if that place, if there's a space for them in that place. And the same thing happened. So d during this time, and it was so the fire carpenting thing started. It was afternoon time. And it continued for long hours. Um, before the sun rise, the Israeli, the, the, the land invasion was started and the Israeli tanks were just in my family area. And did you know? Did you know that the the tanks or the Israeli army is now close to your neighborhood? Since the war started, I was a person who doesn't know how to sleep. I was. It was for me. It was like just dozing off for like fifteen minutes, half an hour, checking the news, and just and also because my sister of the internet connection uh, issue and the power cut so th she told me that if if i find anything in the news if the, if i find if i find out that there is something very dangerous and that they should evacuate that just to let them know even it's like midnight or so i knew from the news from people comments. Okay. I knew where and it was just exactly just in in my in my, my area, I mean the Israeli tanks. And it was it was like a different plan from what happened in twenty fourteen. So it's something that's unexpected for my family. I tried to I tried to reach out to my sisters and just to call anyone. I checked with all like numbers. No one answered and then and then so the two sisters who had the ESIMs 
they they texted me and they told me one of them th she didn't want to scare me so she only said that the situation is dangerous but the other one her text was pray a lot for us they are here okay um and how did you feel receiving I these messages I felt, they are here i felt that they need a miracle to survive right away you yeah. felt this way yeah because it was in december like almost three months after the war started and it and everything was clear that it's, it's a genocide no no exception from anyone no exception um who was in your home back then all my family members my parents and my siblings five siblings my sisters and my brother you said your brother is married no yeah he he, he got married just a year and a few months before uh, a year and a few months now i think yeah was his wife with him no she wasn't because she left just one day before she wanted to check with her family if there is a space in Western Khanunis for my family. My sister told me that they already pack their bags, prepared themselves to go to find a place, but they didn't know where to go. I realized that there is that it was very difficult even for the eSIMs to connect to the internet. And The third day after the invasion, so, or before that, I noticed, I, when I was checking the news channels, I noticed some appeals from, for help for, from our neighbors. And I realized from the location that my family cannot leave the house without help from someone, from, for example, ICRC organization like the, the, why, the why, why did you feel that because in the appeals the neighbors described the situation so they were like we are we are trapped we are uh, surrounded by tanks and there's a lot of um, bombing around us we might not survive for the next hour till the next hour so I realized that the situation of my family is is very dangerous in that it's not only I need to pray a lot, I need, I don't know, to do something. The third day, on the third day, my sister, Reem, who worked with the MSF, she texted me with the appeal that she sent to her work. And she told me, try to send this to anyone who could help us. And I was shocked because I've never imagined that I'd be in this situation. Just what, what was in the appeal? That part of the house is destroyed and that they are they need help and that the medication and my brother is sick and the medication for my mom is not enough. There there wasn't enough food nor water. Um, on the 12th of December, I lost contact with them. So I was... With everyone. Yeah, it was only my two sisters who I was able to connect to whenever they can. They were trying every day to connect to the internet using their eSIMs. A horrible thing happened on the, on the second day. The closest friend of my youngest sister, she's been killed with her family, and she was in Western Khan Yunus. So even my sister was so scared to to turn the eSIM on because it's like a signal from this house. So they don't know how the response of Israeli soldiers would, would be. So she texted me, She her, her friend called Lena, she texted me and she told me,
What did she tell you? She told me they killed Lena with her family. How many members? I can't remember. I, I, I went back to check the news and I saw a list of the family members. I can't remember. And it was very painful for me that I, at that time, I know Lena as well. Mm. She's a very nice person. And at this moment, I was, I don't know, I was, I didn't know what to say how, or how, how, what should I, what should I tell her? Because she was also scared to contact me using the eSIM. So I only told her, okay. May Allah accept her with her family as martyrs, but please take care. We should stop talking. And she said, okay, alhamdulillah. And you said to her, we should stop talking. Yeah. Why? Because I was so scared. I was, I was, my concern was also about my family. I know she felt so sad for losing his, her friend. But at the same time, I was so scared of them, like, connecting to the internet. It's like a signal from a phone. So it's like, you don't know how this is like, how the Israeli soldiers, because they there was a telecommunication caught in our area. So if they've been caught, like, using the internet, I don't know how they but what, is Is that a crime to use the internet? Why were you scared to do something that is legitimate? Because if you use the internet, this means that you give a signal that you are there. You're exposing yourself. And, and you... you it's, it's not a crime to be there. But for them, you are a target. If you're Palestinian, you are a so target. You, so you're saying that any Palestinian is a living and breathing is a target for the yeah. Israeli army. Yeah. They, my family, all of them, they are civilians. All of them, they are teachers, doctors engineers and a physiotherapist but if you are there so you might be the next target it's going to be that kind of collective punishment we we order you to leave this area why didn't you i don't know i was thinking about a hundred of scenarios and did, did the israeli army order your family to evacuate your home not my family in particular but they announced their intention to invade Khan Yunus and the eastern part of Khan Yunus is in their plan. So when they say they want to invade Khan Yunus, that means that everyone should leave Khan Yunus and those who do not leave their homes, they should be killed. Is that this really logic? Apparently it is. Yeah. So what happened to your family then? I lost contact with my family. The 12th of December was the last day I, I was in contact with my family. I, so the days before, my sisters were asking me, did anyone offer to help us? Were anyone ready to help us? I tried to call um, ICRC. Uh, because of the connection issue. So, but my sister, Reem, she managed to call them. So they told her that they are gonna try to evacuate my family from the area and that there is few families around and, but it's unknown when they can do this. So my, my sister kept asking them if they can do or when they can do. So the only thing that she got from them is that you, you should keep yourself away from windows. So after 12th of December, I tried to to find anything about my family, to, to, to know anything about the area. Nothing in the, on the news, nothing. It was like, it was like this area just disappeared. Nothing, nothing is 
she it wasn't it wasn't even mentioned in the news okay there was some news about the um just like general news like for example people who stayed like far away they assume that these bombs like or some or few buildings or there is like the i don't know like fire exchange or whatever then i tried to reach out to people who circulated the appeals for help for our neighbors just to know what happened to the area i didn't get anything what is the name of the neighborhood it's, it's in the same area in Bani Suhaila, Bani Suhaila. but yeah our neighbors so um is Bani Suhaila close to the border it's in eastern part of Khanyu, so it's part, Bani Suhaila, yeah. Abasan, Khuza'a, but they started with Bani Suhaila. So they skipped okay. Khuza'a, Abasan, and started from Bani Suhaila and um, Al Zanna, another area. Because I remember in 2014, Al Zanna and Khuza'a were the most uh, affected by the war. They were erased yeah. from the face of earth. Yeah, this time um, you, you're saying this started with Bani Suhaila. Yeah, parts of Bani Suhaila as well. Yeah, we've been in Bani Suhaila during 2014 till like a month after the war we needed to evacuate. So, and then a week later on, I realized from the news Sorry, I cut. Take your time. Um, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and then from some videos streamed on uh, Al Jazeera, I recognized some of near buildings, so I realized that Yeah, I realized that the situation is very dangerous and I was like, I don't know what my family will will do. So I kept I kept searching for any information about the area. I tried to call all the numbers shared by people who needed help. I even tried to call uh, ICRC. Mm. And I called the number three times and I've been informed by two twice. I've been informed by the person who answered my call that they evacuated my family and that they need to check the names. And then on the third time, after giving the names of, of my dad, the person was like, no, we didn't evacuate this family. Even even that person shares like a clear description of my family house location mm. and he told me yeah this is the Abulipta family and there was a tank in front of the of the door and yeah and he he shared like a description of the the location I tried even my friends they tried to help me to find anything about the area after maybe two weeks, more than two weeks. It was almost four weeks. There were some appeals for people to, they wanted to help to recover some bodies from the area. And I tried to reach out to people who posted the appeal just to know how did they know, how they knew about the area. So when I tried, to find anything about my family. I tried to even to find people, for example, in schools or like refuge centers, or I also contacted British Red Cross because they have the family tracing service. I posted appeals everywhere. I also sent appeal through like media channels and through TVs like Al Jazeera. And I didn't get anything. For how long? For 45 days. 45 days. 
Yeah. You've been trying to reach to your family and you couldn't. Yeah. I've So no calls, no information. No calls, no texts. No one can get to the area. No one knows about them. No one sees them. It was some of people just guessing that they saw one of the family members somewhere, but they weren't sure. I tried to search everywhere, and my friends helped me with that, and my family friends as well, my sister's friends. After 45 days, I got a text on Instagram. It was someone who's, who sent me condolence for losing my family. And when I tried to check how did they, how they knew about that or how or why they say that, they told me that there was a, a story circulated between like some few like um, accounts that all of the family members were killed and the people were only managed to find the body of the youngest, of my youngest sister. He told you that right away? And you yeah. did not know anything about that no. before? No, it was a story and they just like sent me a screenshot of the story and they were like, we saw that story and that's why we, we are sending you the, our condolences. So, and then I posted another story because I wasn't able to reach out to the source of the information or the news. So I asked all like people to not circulate the news because it's not sure. The next day, I got a call that some people managed to, to go to our house and they found a decomposed body there. And they, the group of people managed to recover the body and took the body to a school nearby to oh, bury the Only body. one body? Only one body. And that they think it's for my youngest sister. There was a lot of assumptions about who's the body for. But the body, they told me that it's a body for someone who's been executed because there was a lot of bullets around the body. So sorry. And they, they recognized that it was a woman's body, not a man. A woman from the hair. A woman from the hair. Yeah, they told me it's a decomposed body and you cannot, nothing. They to, I asked them why, when I knew they were already finishing burying the body. So they already buried the body. So I asked them, why didn't they send me like a photo so I can identify who's the body for? But they told me, you can't know. They told me it's just like a few of the body legs, like in the arms and the feet. If you can know from the feet or the hair. They told me also about stuff they found it around, like a phone for one of my sister, passports for another sister's. But the body was found in the home, yeah. in your home, and your home was not damaged. It was. It was still standing, but it was no walls. No so, walls. Yeah, I before that new news, I tried to get a satellite photo for our house, and I realized from the photo that I got a high resolution one, and I realized that the house was attacked by air missiles from the top. And there was a lot of distractions around the house, like okay. like our neighbor's houses are not there anymore. So I hope that my family left the house before anything bad happened or before these attacks. So, yeah. So you found one body and uh you still do not know who it belongs to for sure? No, I wasn't. I wasn't sure who's the body for. And they told me that um, one of my uncles was in the school and they asked him to try to identify 
the body, but he wasn't able. He just like he assumed that it's for one of my doctor's sisters. It was just an assumption. And they told me we buried the body, we buried her with some of her stuff. So maybe I don't know, maybe someone else like when they try to open the They can know about her. So, on the same day, on that night, I got maybe a hundred or more of texts from many people who heard the news and he wanted to check on me or to check if the news is, is correct. So, the news I got, it was all the family killed and that were, that people were only able like to recover one body and they don't know about the other body because people who went there they risk their lives they risk their lives one of them is my brother's friend one of them On, is your brother's a friend yeah is my brother did he friend. go there yeah he he went there with with his wife they risk their life just to go to the house and check so I tried to call her just to, I don't know, to double check if the information I got, uh, like, is correct. On that night, I noticed there was, at the beginning, there was a lot of um, people who, who were, like, asking me what happened to the family. And if they found, and if people who recovered the body were able to find any other bodies or like find any signs that there are other bodies, like the smell or. So I. I wanted to answer at, even at that time. I was like, maybe someone knows something. So maybe I should, maybe I should check all texts. Maybe they know something. Yeah. I wanted to check the app, a Telegram, and because you know it's like a lot, there are a few news channel on Telegram, and I noticed that the latest news on one of the channels was about a video for a decomposed body in our house, and they mentioned my dad's name. There was a decomposed body found in. Hamdan's house, Hamdan Apolipter house. And... And people say that this was your father? It was... Okay, it was... My friends, at the beginning, my friends didn't want me to see the video because the title is like for a decomposed body, so they didn't want me to see it. The title said? A decomposed body. A decomposed body. So they wanted to check the video before I see the video. Um, yeah, and then I checked the video. And I tried to reach out to the journalist who posted that video. To know from him who, who's been there or who because they mentioned in the video that there were two bodies but I only heard about one body so when I contacted the journalist um, I tried to make comment ask people to just to connect me with the journalist so I can know maybe the journalist knows something knows something and the journalist sent me a longer video it was recorded someone was in the house a recorded most like areas in the house like the corners of the house and I realized how much damage there was in the house they told me that my family stuff were scattered everywhere there was I realized that the satellite photo what I knew from satellite photo yeah it was it was like so the house is two floors so the upper one was attacked multiple times from the air and the first one i realized that the tank okay 
I realized from the video that the first floor were attacked by tanks missiles and uh, the tanks bulldozed like the area around and that the tanks went inside the house uh, we used to have a big garden around the house and a and a high fence from the video i realized that everything disappeared around the house no trees no fence and part of the fence was inside the house And there are no walls, so it's just like the house is still standing, but there are no walls. So, when I saw the parts of the house that's been attacked by missiles, um, like, okay, so someone might be there, so people might not find the body. And when I saw that the tanks bulldozed the area. I'm like, okay, there's also a possibility that they crushed my family under the tanks and they just bought the sands over them. There was a lot of thoughts in my mind. From the video, I wasn't able to know from the hair of the body, who's the body for, but from the feet, because part of the feet was still not decomposed. I was like, okay, this body is for either my sisters or my mom, but I think it's for one of my sisters. There were... Maybe because people around me, some people around me were shocked. Mm. I don't know. One of the scenario was like, okay, maybe that's only one body and the rest of the family were arrested or were taken somewhere. And I was like, okay, maybe I can think, I can only think about this. I can hope that they are still them, some, they are somewhere and they are okay. And maybe this body is not for, I even, I even tried to deny that I saw the body. One week later on, one week later, I got a call that people tried to go again to our house. It was still very dangerous. Whoever goes there, they are risking their lives. So they told me that they found two bodies and they think the bodies are for my mom and one of my sisters, Reem. And they told me that they found the body. We have, there is, there is, there is like a factory, like next to our house. And there is like a huge like space and a yard. They found me that they found the two bodies in the factory. It's like open area. They found me that they found the bodies in that area. So you said they found two bodies in an open area, mm -hmm. in a factory. Mm -hmm. So how did you or, or them uh, make sure that this is your mother and your sister? Because it's not in your home. Yeah. So the lady who called me and who went there, she knows my family. She's a friend. She's a friend. She knows my mom and my sisters. She told me, we found your mom and your sister, Reem. And she told me also about stuff they found. She told me that there were bandages on their bodies, but, and that it was, and they didn't, they weren't able to recover the bodies because the quad captors just like, um, so try to shoot them so they run away and lift the bodies there my god i was waiting every day just for people to recover the bodies and just to double check that they are my family members 
I've waited for three years. Uh, three, sorry, three weeks. For me, it was longer three than weeks. three weeks. For me, it was longer than three years, but it was like the time doesn't going. So after three weeks, which means four weeks after finding the first body, after three weeks. But before that, during this time, there was a lot of rumors that the bodies are not for my family members, they are for other people. And then the next day, people realize that the other people that they think the body for, they are somewhere and they are alive. So after the three weeks, people managed to recover the bodies. And they were trying to reach out to me to identify the bodies. Generally, I'm the one who used, I used to tell my sisters, don't send me your photo if you are not smiling in the photo. But I've never imagined that I will crop that their smiles and send the photos to people to recognize who's the body for from the teeth. Because the bodies were decomposed to the point that even my relatives weren't able to identify who's the body for. And for me, I didn't want to see the decomposed body because I saw one at the beginning of the war. Until now, I can't forget this. And I didn't want to, this to, to be added to my family photos. But at the same time, people were, they wanted me at least to see the clothes so they sent me photos, photos for, they found a stud, like a gold stud, it wasn't one of the bodies, and it was my mom's stud, like earrings. And from the clothes, like the prayer clothes, these are for us, for my moms and sisters, but I'm not sure who we, who was, what. They told me that, there was a cannula in my mom's arm and there was a bandage in her body but they weren't sure where the bandage was because the body was decomposed and for the other body they told me they sent me a photo the bandage was around the head the triangle bandage because i've been trained as a first aider I, i'm like okay that's that was a bandage for a head injury So, so for me, I was thinking maybe the, my mom and my sister were injured and one of my sisters, the doctor one, tried to help or to first aid them. I saw also they sent me photos for the body bags and a photo for that photo for the head I tried to know from the hair who's the body for but I wasn't able my some of my relatives they identify my mom's body from the teeth my mom known by her smile, she has a nice smile, and she is the one who's, I can say, the life in every for any place she's in. They told me when they told me that they identified her from the teeth, and that my uncle was one of the people who identified her. I was like, okay, so if they mention the teeth, so it's my mom's body. For the body of my sister, there were some assumption that it was this name. The doctor who started specializing in cardiology.
Yeah, but I'm I'm not sure who's the body for. Um, so the first body was buried in Al Auda School. It's Al. He was buried where I studied my, or my secondary school, and when all of us, all my sisters, studied for their secondary schools. The second body is because it was a very dangerous at that time to take the body to that school. So they took the bodies to Rafah to bury the body. They told me that, it was, it was, I mean, till now, it's still very dangerous for people to go to the house or check if there are any other bodies. So I know that logically, my family experienced a horrific thing after the first body was executed and the second body were injured. So I don't know about the rest of the family. There are still four missing. Four are still missing. Yeah, because people can't go to the house to, to check under the rubble or people were trying just to check if there is any like smell for decomposed body or yeah um, so you found four bodies and four are still missing sorry three bodies were found three bodies were found were and four are still missing okay with this voice i feel like i'm the i'm there now The voice of the sound, the sound of the helicopter. Of, yeah, the sound of the helicopter. It took me there. Um, well, Hala, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to respond. But where do you think the four missing are? Do you think they could be kidnapped by the Israelis? The thing is that they told me, people told me that there were Israeli soldiers in our house. They found some of their stuff there. What I think is that all of my family members were killed before they get into the house. They won't get into the house without bombing a house or just randomly shoot like in the air I don't know I'm not sure so maybe they were killed even I don't know I don't know but the thing is that the two bodies that were found in the yeah in our neighbors area just like put me in front of a lot of questions I've tried to even I mean my friends they try to help me and my family friends they try to reach out to people who've been released from Israeli prisons during the last now it's it's more than three months now since I lost contact with my family so my friends and I were trying to check the list of the names of people who've been released trying to ask any of them if they hear like about the family name my family name my sister-in-law tried to show them some of my family members photos but because no luck i also tried to contact the I updated the British Red Cross on the situation until now I I haven't heard anything if they know or if they get any do you think they they have tried going to the Israeli side and ask about the four missing people if they are held 
I, as I understood, I had I had a discussion with um, one of the team, and as I understood, they, they, their plan is to check with Israeli uh, if they arrest any of my family members. But they told me that there is no like timeline for this. They're, they don't know when they can get an answer. And it's I been three months now since you lost contact with your family. Yeah, and it's a month and a half or more since I uh, informed the British, and, uh, British Red Cross. I also tried to contact the Palestinian... Um, sorry, the Commission of Palestinian Detainees in Ramallah. They told me that they are going to try to help, but that the situation is very difficult if people, if the arrested people are from Gaza. They cannot know anything. They are tried, They are going to try to help, but they cannot guarantee anything. And Hala, since this happened to your family, since you lost contact with your family and then you identified some bodies of your family, you haven't spoken out about it. No. You haven't written about it. Why? Because I'm trying just to put this or to put what I'm feeling in words, but it's, it is the pain and the, it, it is mainly the uncertainty. It is mainly the uncertainty that might remain forever. Because I'm aware that now there are thousands of people in Gaza who are missing. 10,000 people who are missing. Yeah. And uh, I might never find the body of my the bodies of my family members. But now you have decided to speak up. Why? Yeah. I So this uncertainty it was the whole thing uh, it impact. It's impact. It is impact impacting my physical and mental health. And I didn't even give myself the time to to process what happened to my family and that three of them now three of them now are killed. And the scenarios that come to my mind about how these have been killed are horrible and it's about my family i felt i'm inside a bubble with these invisible wounds it's easy for people to see the physical wounds to see the the color of the blood to smell the smell to even to touch it or to realize how much this wound is painful, but for mental wounds, no one, no one can do so. It's like, and I felt that whatever I say, it's not gonna change anything in the in the in the reality. I've tried to escape. I I I'm in a deny. That doesn't help me even, but at the same time, I wanted to have the hope that someone is still alive. But I reached a point that so when when we lose someone we 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 love it it, it is like we have these inner voices, we blame ourselves. In different ways maybe i was like maybe if i was with them i would maybe 
encourage them to leave earlier or maybe if i was with them maybe i will i don't know first aid one of them or i don't know help them in a way that keep them alive and it, it it is till now it is very difficult for me even to look at the message or to answer the calls of people who wanted to check on me or asked about my family also so i decided to to give these ones void a voice i decided to get out of the bubble tell the story at some point i felt like I should talk to someone who went through a similar situation. I don't have question, any question in my mind. I don't have anything to say. I just want to talk with them. So I told my friend. I told my friend Yara, and she's your colleague as well. I told her that I want to talk to her. Ahmed. At the same time, I was hesitant that I didn't want to trigger anything for, for you or for anyone I want to talk to. But I was like, I don't know, maybe, it may be you or other people I talk to. Maybe you say something that helped me to. It's not to cope or to deal. It's 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 something that I don't know how to describe it. And I was also thinking that maybe there was someone in Gaza or somewhere who's going through the same ex the same experience, and they want to feel that there is someone who feels the same pain, and there is someone who can relate. They, I had the hope for during all the months that someone is still alive, but I also at some point am um, like, I started like not blaming myself, but thinking that way, this way. It's like, am I selfish if I want someone to be still alive? Because the only, the only scenario they would be alive and is that they are, they've been kidnapped from the house they've been arrested and because of the torture that Palestinian people experience in prisons I'm like am I selfish if I want someone to be still alive because this mean this means that they experienced what happened in the house and at the same time they experienced the torture in the prison because now it's more than three months and no human being being can survive all of this there was also an investigation who run by an organization the organization hired an investigator whose whose work is to investigate war crimes and who also investigated war crimes in my area in Bani Suhaila in particular So the investigator tried to collect or to gather information about what might happen to my family. And because of the telecommunication issue, it took a few weeks. But a few days ago, the investigator's report comes with the assumption that all of the family members were killed because there is no other evidence that support other assumptions that was when that was a few days after the body of my mom and my sister were buried so I felt that okay I should talk about it I'm so sorry Hala and you know, as you are speaking, 
I I got a flashback of my situation and what happened to my family. And I can't say that my pain is similar to yours or that I feel the same pain as you have. Because eventually I know the fate of all my family members. Yes, 21 were killed of my family, but I know they were killed. And I knew that right away. And uh, because I knew that right away, I, I recovered fast. I couldn't say I recovered fully, but I'm dealing with the trauma that I'm having. But you, you st three months after month, and you still don't know the fate of your family. And this is one of the most heartbreaking stories I've ever heard in my life. And there are no words to to tell you that maybe can make you feel comfortable or ease the pain that you're having. But as, as I said to you three weeks ago when you called me and you just wanted to talk to someone who, who shares your suffering, my advice to you was to speak up and to talk about your family in the hopes that one day maybe those who wronged your family and my family can come to justice, can be brought to justice. We also have to speak up because we want to immortalize the stories of our family. We want to share their stories with the world. We want everyone to know who are your parents and my parents, your siblings and my siblings, and our nieces and nephews. We want the world to know who these people were and what their life was and how were they killed. And we want the world to know our suffering, our trauma, our pain. Because they need to know and because they need to know because they need to act now. Until now we are talking about three months after, three months after you lost your family. And the genocide is still ongoing. It hasn't stopped. Three months and you still can't know the fate of your family. You still can't go back to Gaza to see even the, the bodies of your family. And I can't go back to see my home, the rubbles of my home. I still can't go to the graves of my family because there is still a genocide uh, that is taking place in Gaza. So we want the world to know in the hopes that maybe they can do something to stop this genocide, to stop the suffering of my people. And I really salute you for agreeing to speak up, to talk about your family. And uh, yes, this is only one, one show, but I really hope that your story uh, get told. And I really hope that more, more and more people can know and learn about your family and maybe some people in, in a position of power who can actually uh, get some news that could see, soothe you. I really hope that the four missing people are kidnapped. I really hope that they are not killed or hurt or injured. Um, I know that they are either killed or kidnapped um, and I know that most likely they were killed but I really hope that they are kidnapped, at least one day they can be released. But tell how are you now? How do you feel? I don't know. I, I cannot express my feelings. I cannot put in words what I'm feeling. Especially when I realize that it's more than three months now. And that... Because it's a very long time. So... The hope is, the hope is someone that someone is still alive. Is it's it's not there. The thing is that one of the reasons why I also took today, I thought about kids who lost their families, the only survival kids. I was thinking, okay, at least I can talk about it, but it's going to be very difficult for kids in Gaza to talk about it. We tell the story, it's a very like brief story. There's a lot of pain between lines. There is 
there is a lot of pain, a lot of no sleeping nights, unimaginable pain. And the only thing that I'm relying on for now, I, at some point, I feel like even experts in psychology, they will not, never, they will not ever like be able to help me. But I feel like my religion does because we have this belief that our families are still alive. Are still alive in the sky. The, one of the one of the stories that I heard it was. I felt I I don't know how to express that, but it was my brother's friend. He has three kids, and my brother used to spend time with them, and they like him. I think the oldest is 10 years, more or less. But my brother's friend asked his oldest one, oldest kid, do you think that he's still alive about my brother? And he said, do, do you think he's OK? And the kid answered his dad. He was like, I think he's OK. But in either situation, may Allah grant him his mercy and then he asked his son again do you think that we will see him again and the kid answered yeah I think we will see see him again for me it was like my brother's friend he's a close friend he was so desperate to get the hope through anyway and the kid was trying to assure his father was trying to assure his father that my brother is still okay and they are gonna see him that yeah there was there was a few days ago three days ago Ramadan just started and for us Ramadan we can say as the family month in every moment from the sunrise to the sunset day and night on the on my first day, I was I was waiting for Adan to break my fasting. For for a second, I saw myself sitting in our house in the same place where my family and I used to sit for our iftar, but instead of my family around me, their sounds, the laughs, the lights, the decoration, the house and the food. I saw myself sitting there, surrounded by the body bags that they found and by the destruction inside the house. It was, it's something I cannot put in, in words. So, yeah, but I decided to tell some some of the story and yeah i'm i was encouraged by you to talk about this thank you for helping me to and encouraging me to talk about this yeah are you coping sometimes i feel like no one can cope because I feel like no one can cope because everyone you love is a piece of your soul. If they leave, they leave this they leave this space empty. So, okay, you can survive, you can live your life, you can go on, you can move toward what you want and what toward your plans, but you'll never be the same person as you were before the before your loss. And especially if it's like all your family yeah do you still have any living siblings no nieces nephews no 
parents, you know. Yeah. But you have Asala. Um, I, I'm not just saying this to to comfort you. I I also lost my family, and you know, uh, but unlike you, I I I spoke up. The first day I learned the news, and then I found hundreds and thousands of people here in the UK and all around the world who came for me and who supported me and who acted like a family to me. And I'm really sure that um, everyone here in the UK and everyone of, of those who will watch this uh, show will be family to you. I'm really certain of that because yes we have witnessed a genocide in Palestine we have dealt with monsters in Palestine but there's a lot of good people in this universe there's a lot of good people who will want to take care of you who will want to support you who will want to be by your side and I am imagine like I'm, I'm your brother I, I swear thank you uh, I was and, sorry Go ahead, please. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say, to be honest. I, No matter how hard I try to to speak to you, I can't. I, there are no words, really, no words. One of the painful things that I'm going through is to have a wish that you can find something, I can find something about my family and if they are not alive anymore at least to find the bodies so I'm looking to myself I'm like okay so this is my wish now at the same time I hope I'm the last one in Gaza who experienced this my youngest sister she she kept asking me did you hear anything about a ceasefire did you did you hear is there any news about ceasefire so every time i heard the now the word ceasefire i think what if the ceasefire was like months ago how many people would we save how many lives would we save how many families thousands yeah Yeah, and now my wish is just to find anything about. Yeah, I'm. I'm still. I'm still checking the news. I'm still like twenty four seven on the news. Even I've been advised to not do so. To help myself, to help myself, at least my mental health. But I still have the hope that. The situation in my area is, I don't know, allowing people to go to our house and check other, I don't know, areas. I'm aware that there are many scenarios for, if no one is still alive, that there are many scenarios for where the bodies would be. And I know that this uncertainty might remain forever. When I talked about that we all I mean, all Palestinians now, we we felt that, I mean, since the starting of the war, we felt like we are in, in a queue because of the stories we heard about other, like, friends or colleagues, the stories of loss. Just two weeks before I got the news about the first body that I found in the in our house, one of my friends, her family remains in Gaza, in Gaza City. She lost her sister and her sister's husband and their kids and the family of her, of her sister's husband. And then a week later, 
another friend. She lost three of her sisters with their kids. During that, during that time, I was still knowing nothing about my family, but I've tried to to support. Even I felt like I cannot do anything, and my situation doesn't help me to to support as I used to be with my friends, but. I was trying hard to do so, and then after I got the news about my family, these friends, they tried to support me as well. So it was like, the thing is that, I mean, in many cases, people who try to support you, they are, if I can say, maybe in a bitter situation, or at least they are strong to do so they are not going th through the same the same suffering but what i think in our case we hold or we try to deal with our pain and at the same time to help other to to be stronger and to deal with the pain and it's not it's a very difficult it's a very difficult thing to do. It's I, I still think it is beyond human capabilities. So, And it is still ongoing. It, it looks like there is no end for this, for this misery. So, yeah. Uh, speaking about how to end this misery that is inflicted on the Palestinian people, I think we should talk about two things here. One is the media, the Western media, the mainstream media, and the one is the political class in the UK and the US. Because I believe that Israel would never have done what it has done now in Gaza. All of this genocide, the starvation of the people, the killing of children, the civilians, the women, without the cover from, one, the Western media, and two, uh, the political class in the UK and the US, or in the West in general. And um, I understand that you decided not to speak out, to speak up about your family for the past three months, but now you have. And uh, I understand after this interview, maybe you will, uh, maybe the Western media will pick up your story and talk about it, uh, similar to what happened to me. When it comes to media, uh, are you worried that uh, the Western media might take your story and not tell it as it is or play with the facts or um, dehumanize these, the, the, your family in a way that they did with many other Palestinians who lost their families. For example, I, I was um, interviewed by the Western media many, many times. And many of, the, many, many of these interviews were dehumanizing to me. And they were they were not they were not very professional let's say that tomorrow after we publish this interview you are uh, your story is picked up by the western media and they start interviewing you will you accept to be interviewed with uh, by the western media or will you have some concerns i think it depends on the on the media i will because there are some platforms that i already followed some and i noticed i noticed many things one was the discrimination the discriminative language um, that's been used in the media against palestinians i think the stories of people should be spotlighted as every life matters not according to what the interviewers or the platform like has in the have the have in their mind 
But I'm also happy that the social media or like platforms play key ro role in this in in this war. It's 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 not the the formal news media role anymore. Now everyone can pick the phone, record a video, and tell the story, and we can hear real stories, not like fabricated ones. It's it's it is what happening to Palestinians. It is their suffering. It is. Yeah. What do you think of the um, UK's government stance on this genocide? Are they enablers of the genocide? Are they uh, supporting Israel? Are they neutral? What do you think of their uh, stance? I think the UK government plays a major role, like globally, and they can be one of the governments that stop this genocide they can they can so if they call for a ceasefire or if they work toward a ceasefire i think they they are able to to let that happen <clears throat> and why do you think they do not want to end this genocide i don't know i'm not sure i think that's that's a question that they should answer why why a call for a ceasefire not been not been implemented like much earlier it's, it's, it's still i mean the war is still going and going for me uh, i'm at a point where i feel like there is no end for this yeah if, if you want my opinion i'm so disappointed with the western media so disappointed with the British government, so disappointed with the American uh, administration. They all have played a role in uh, prolonging the genocide. They, they have not called for a ceasefire. And even when some political parties call for a ceasefire, they call for a ceasefire, but they never do action to stop the genocide. They, they only have words and no action at all. So I'm personally I'm I'm I'm, I'm disappointed, and when um, the, when I was asked uh, who I blame after I lost my family, I blamed everyone. I blamed the American government. I blamed the British government. I blamed the Western media, and I said it loudly and clearly that yes, the Israelis pulled the trigger, but there are many people who were behind Israel, who provided the weapon, who provided the missiles that killed our family and also who provided the diplomatic cover for Israel uh, to do its genocide and those who have a played role in uh, providing a media cover for Israel to, uh, to, to, to commit as many massacres as, as possible against the Palestinian people. So I think all of these, they all played uh, a role in, in the genocide. And now when we talk about the victims of this war, my family and your family. My family, 14 kids were killed in my home. 14 kids and uh, three women and uh, an old man and your family. We're talking about two doctors, two engineers, a psychotherapist and uh, two teachers. These are the victims of this genocide. So clearly this is not a war against Hamas as they claim. Clearly this is a war against the Palestinian people and only the Palestinian people, the civilians, are, uh, are the targets of this war. And it's clear that Israel is targeting everyone. Uh, they're not targeting the militants. They don't care about the militants. They care about revenge and only revenge because they want to inflict as much suffering and horror on the Palestinian people as possible. Uh, we, you have said something that one of your sisters, it was clear that she was executed. And, and was she a doctor? No, she, she was uh, the software engineer, right? I'm not sure. The You're assumption, not sure, yeah, the assumptions. So, I mean, either so, my sister, so either the doctors, the physiotherapist, or the software the doctor, engineers. The doctor, the physiotherapist, software engineer, someone like this, why would someone like this be executed? 
what danger could this female young doctor or uh, an engineer would pose to the Israelis? Uh, clearly, this is a war against the Palestinian people. And uh, clearly, these governments in the US and the UK know that Israel is targeting the civilians and they are after revenge. They know that they are starving the entire population of Gaza. They know that they are starving one million children in Gaza. And yet, they are still, they still shy away from calling for a ceasefire. They still shy away from uh, banning uh, arm exports to Israel. So clearly, they are playing a role in our genocide in Palestine. And I believe that if we want to change the situation in Palestine, these governments have to listen to people like me and you. And they have to act. And they have to stop to stop enabling the genocide in, in Palestine. And I, I really want you to, to send a message from your heart to the British government. What would you tell them? I'm a pharmacist and I also worked in the humanitarian field. So I always had this thought. Why don't we stop the wars from happening instead of moving to help people after the war or like affected by wars? Why do we let wars happen? So why there is no any call for a ceasefire till now? All my family members, my siblings in particular, all their goals were to give back to their community, to the Palestinian community, to work, to work locally and globally as glo global citizens, to help their community and the whole world to develop to help people in their community by killing my family members. Again, like two doctors, two engineers, and a physiotherapist, all their goals just disappeared. So they are wiped out. They are, they are not here. So why, why, why this thing already allowed to be happen? Why? That's, that's my question, why? Why this happened to my family? They did nothing wrong. Is, is it like, is their fault to, to live in Gaza or to stay in Gaza or to, to work hard to help the Palestinian community, their community, to help their people? For me, I don't find a reason for all of this, and I don't find a reason for not calling for a ceasefire. I'm still saying this. I say this every day. I hope, that's one of my wishes now, to be the last one who's, who's suffering the same thing. I don't want to hear more stories or stories about more people who's going through the same as my story. I think is the justice what we need? What does justice look like to you? Justice means a lot of things. It means protection or protecting people's right, right to live, right to educate, Right, it's it's one of one of the explanation for justice is to protect others people lives, especially vulnerable people. And in this situation, all Palestinians are, are vulnerable people and they should get the protection they need. They should get their rights protected wherever they are. Also for me, as in the law, to find the killer, to get to the court, and 
to get the punishment they they deserve it's to it's it's by imposing the law it's by imposing the law and protecting people's rights um despite of all of this genocide and horror and pain and the trauma and disappointment from the political class here and everywhere i always see that there is a glimmer of hope and this glimmer of hope comes from the streets of london every saturday the people who protest for the past five months every single saturday in london in edinburgh in glasgow and everywhere in the uk and the us and all around the world these people give me a lot of hope that uh, that this genocide can't can't just uh, pass that these wrong doors will come to justice one day and give me a lot of hope that there is a lot of good people in this universe in this world what message would you send to those people who protest every Saturday in London and all across the world for Palestine? For me, seeing these people like protest and trying to do everything they can to support Palestinians, it's, it's heartwarming thing. I felt like, okay, there is someone who's who's trying to support. Uh, we are not suffering in silence. So our voices are heard. Our pains and our wounds are visible. And there are thousands of people who are trying to support. And yeah, I sometimes I, I can't find like words to 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 express how much grateful I am for these people and how much I wanted them to continue, to continue supporting Palestinians, to continue their calling or their asking for a ceasefire to, yeah, because yeah, because because we also have the right to live in peace, to, to live our life away from suffering. For me, it's like an inherited thing because I used to hear stories from my parents about the wars that they witnessed in 1967 and about their parents as well, how much they suffered. Is it like an inherited thing to take that pain to each generation, and but it's like in a different way, and why? Why? That's my question. Why and for how long? Do you see a future for Gaza? Based on what's going on now, no. I feel like this war. If if this war is not stopped, I don't. I don't. Sometimes I feel like maybe no one will still alive. We'll still like stay alive in Gaza. I don't know. Because now there are ten of thousands of people who've been killed. More than ten thousand of people who are missing. Okay. And if this continued, the population in Gaza is almost two million. So if this continued. And in 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 an open air prison. So how can I assume that people were still alive? And even if this war stopped, this is this doesn't mean that the end of the suffering. There's a lot of things that will that we will know about after the war finish or ends or whatever. Yeah, there's a lot of things, and I think that will need like huge efforts by humanitarian organizations not to help people recover but at least to i don't know to do something and it's gonna be little thing in in the face of i'm not di diminishing like the efforts done by humanitarian organizations but i mean 
that's what's going on in Gaza. It's a very huge thing, and it needs a lot of efforts and long, lo very long years, very long years. Maybe, maybe we will not even be able to help people to recover partially from what's going on there, maybe for decades, because everyone in Gaza is witnessing what's going on now, including kids. Thank you very much. I really, really, really appreciate your time. And I really appreciate you came all the way from Glasgow to London to record this show uh, with us. The most importantly, I really hope that those who have wronged you will be brought to justice very, very, very soon. Thank you very much again.